So good evening, good afternoon, good morning, even good night, depending on where you are viewing us from. Welcome to LRB Screen at Home. Some of us are at home, some of us are not at home here. In the UK, lockdown is now a movable feast, literally a feast that you can move to a playground, a park, an open space anywhere near you. My name is Gareth Evans. I am the host of LRB Screen at Home. Before we go any further, please do join me in welcoming our guest, Chiara Ambrosio. Welcome, Chiara. Hi, Gareth. Hello. Fa everyone. Fabulous to have you with us. Fabulous to have you with us. It's a great uh, lineup of activity we have with you uh, uh, talk, to talk about this evening. And thank you so much for giving us not just one, but two films this week to view. Let me just remind our viewing audience, uh, drawn, of course, from across the world, thank you very much indeed, everyone, for being with us, that normally we uh, show one film in the previous week. And then, of course, uh, are in conversation, as we are now with Chiara, uh, with the filmmaker or the commentator in question about that film. Now, this week, we decided to raise the, uh, the stakes considerably. And we are now uh, uh, able to talk about, and of course, we offered two films, two feature length uh, documentary uh, essays by uh, Kiara, wonderful artist filmmaker uh, with much else on her portfolio, which we'll come to uh, later in the conversation. This is about an hour long. Uh, those of you who've been with us before will uh, know the format. You're able to uh, send questions in and comments in uh, via the YouTube stream, uh, the comments box as normal on any YouTube uh, screen. And do please constructively comment as you go through. Sam is literally there as I speak, uh, taking comments and feeding questions directly into my head. Uh, via this incredible earpiece <laughs> that I'm wearing at the moment. In a similar way, Anthony, of course, those of you who have been with us regularly will know all about Anthony, how important he is to the operation, is actually managing uh, the visual interface with reality that we are currently calling uh, the Kiara Gareth uh, screen space uh, opportunity. <laughs> Kiara, of course, <laughs> essential to this undertaking, and more uh, from her very, very shortly. But I cannot, of course, proceed any further without thanking both the London Review of Books and the London Review Bookshop, whose initiative uh, this is, of course, and uh, without whom we would be nothing. We would literally be uh, floating in the ether, unanchored even to a digital pixel, let alone to any other form of reality. The LRB has been going for more than 40 years. I'm going to hold up now uh, the current issue, just to prove in a kind of hostage, hostage format, format way that I am actually live at the moment. Of course, there's about a 10 day uh, window for this, so it would have a, a few dates uh, days to run. But I'll look at it now just to show you the LRB always ahead of the game. This one is dated the 21st of May. That's tomorrow. So we're actually ahead of the game here. Uh, this is uh, dated for tomorrow. That is the LRB. It comes, of course, in this compostable bag, which is important to know. A lot of uh, comments on the uh, Guardian letters page, obviously not quite a rival publication, a, a fellow traveler perhaps in the world, uh, about the uh, disturbing uh, developments in the Guardian compostable bag scenario. Some people very unhappy about which bin to put it in. Um, I, I would say with this one compostable, put it wherever you, uh, you gather your compost, um, while you may, of course, and uh, that's what happens with the bag. LRB, wonderful publication, bookshop outstanding. Enormous thanks to Claire, Natalia, Gail, and everyone else at the bookshop uh, for making that undertaking uh, the reality and the uh, success that it is. Now, we're going to go into conversation now with Kiara um, about all sorts of activities that she's uh, involved with. She's a, an artist, a filmmaker, an animator, a salon host, a radio presenter, and much, much more. But just to tell you now, uh, so that you stay with us for the duration, we're going to be talking about the two films that we've uh, uh, made available to you this week. But we're also... Uh, and I'm delighted to, to say that this has been possible. We're going to be ending uh, this week's transmission with a live improvisation by Mikey Kirkpatrick, AK Bird Radio, AK the composer of the wonderful score that accompanies uh, the film that we've been seeing this week, The Ghost Frequency. Enormous pleasure to be uh, speaking uh, with Mikey to introduce him um, at the end uh, of this, uh, this week's session. So Kiara, thank you again so much uh, for being with us. It's a real pleasure to have you here. And with The Ghost Frequency, a wonderful film, which we've uh, been fortunate enough to have uh, to have shown in uh, in the live uh, incarnations of the world uh, in, in uh, previous time, but it seems to make complete sense to bring it here into the context of this screening series, which of course is finding titles um, that speak creatively and associatively uh, to the time, the strange time we find ourselves in. Now, I know that you obviously made the film available uh, in, in the earlier weeks of lockdown, and you obviously felt then that it had a, a kind of something that it could say to this moment. What was it that particularly prompted you to do that? Well, first of all, thank you so much. It's a pleasure to be here. And um, the, the reason why I made the film available is because we are talking so much about um, what it means to um, be present. I mean, not just now that we are um, um, divided from one another and, and removed from space, but also in general, uh, the question of presence um, is, is 
sort of fundamental to our ability to understand place. And um, similarly, um, this was a question that was crucial to the making of the ghost frequency. I was trying to um, understand what physical presence could could say about um, memory and about um, understanding your journeys through through life, through space and time. And so I thought this is a time when we're trying to understand what it means to be um, alive when we're at a time when we feel ourselves disappearing from the world. And uh, the ghost frequency was very much the opposite journey. It was going back to a place that had been partly abandoned to try and conjure things that had disappeared back into presence. And I thought it was a really interesting exercise to represent at this moment in time and to consider when thinking about what what is real, first of all, and uh, what do we, what are our tools for understanding a reality that is often slipping um, in terms of our perception. Thank so you. That's, no, thank you so much. I mean, that's a great opener. I mean, the, 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 the tension, if you'd like, between past and present, and also obviously between absence and presence, as you've uh, already uh, very lucidly identified, is crucial to the film, isn't it? Because it's a very strange settlement in all sorts of ways. It's a, a, a living village, it's a working village on its kind of perimeter, but at the heart is this kind of abandonment, this form of of sort of um, livable absence that that clearly is the kind of gravitational center of the settlement, but is one that has a very strange relationship with the outer, uh, more occupied houses. I mean, how did you first of all come across this village? So first of all, it's um, it's important to say that, like with m much of my work, um, a lot of it came from um, reality. And I was reading something. There's a um, filmmaker you know really well, Teresa Stelikova, who runs this um, event called Ecstatic Truth. And the idea of ecstatic truth, you know, something um, a, 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 a mandate on how to think about documentary. You're looking at a reality, but you're looking at ways in which the ecstasy of an experience can be translated into, into film. And um, for me, I was looking for a way back home. Uh, home in a very large sense, you know. At that moment in time, I had lost my grandparents who came from the south of Italy, and I had lost my connection, my my given connection to a place that was very important to me, a part of 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 um, Italy that was very important to to like like quintessential to my being, and I felt um, at risk of of go, you know, of of losing my 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 hold on reality. And so I went back with the intention of shooting something familiar. I was looking for a place I knew. Instead, by pure coincidence, I found a place I had never been to, which was just a 20 minute drive from where my childhood home was. And this place is Verbicaro, where we shot the film. And I discovered that um, the, the peculiarity of this place is that the center of it, as you described, had been abandoned, but the villagers still owned all of the homes. And in fact, they spoke about it as a temple. And it actually had the shape of a temple. It's a little sort of enclave in right in the middle of a new build that uh, was, was erected around the 60s because it was cheaper than fixing the old homes. And ever since they've had this dual existence, they have a more modern existence on the outskirts of this temple, which is at once abandoned, but also full of care as often these things are. It's full of care because the, the villagers look on it as a receptacle of their own uh, identity, history, and not just memory, but also living memory. And it's very much alive, you know, nature is, is pretty much like in London, it's reclaiming it all. It's incredible how quickly nature comes back, life comes back when what we consider to be life leaves. No, thank you so much. I mean, that relationship between, of course, you know, if you like the kind of the past and the present, the living and the dead, uh, the inhabited and the abandoned is much more porous than we often find it to be here. You're right, of course, to identify how things have changed in a way during lockdown, animals feel more confident and so on. And, and the natural world is slightly you know, recalibrated that we hope for obviously, you know, uh, a, a, lot, a much greater period to come. But what is very striking about this this village in terms of the ecstatic truth idea that you mentioned, which I think is a phrase borrowed from Werner Herzog's description of, of, it, you know, yeah. of, of how film can work, is that in Herzog's case, of course, he you know he 
more often than not travels to some extremity, some you know either geographical or uh, meteorological sort of um, outer limit, and finds you know humanity there in some kind of uh, new way of being. But you can obviously travel ecstatically much more closely to home. And one yeah. of the great journeys you have to make, of course, is to meet is to meet meet the other, meet other people um, in a way that feels, you know, authentic and valid and true, doesn't it? I mean, it's not just because you're Italian and you know Southern Italy doesn't mean you can walk into a village and and gain the trust uh, of the inhabitants to the degree that you did to be able to un, un, sort of um, uncover or tease out some of these wonderful stories that you do. So give us a sense of, of you know, how your relationship with the with the settlement developed. Well, I should mention, first of all, that my background is in animation. So I'm also an animator. And that's a very important um, aspect of how I look. Uh, so for me, um, looking through a camera um, is very much a process of, of conjuring. So my, you know, um, it's, it's about framing and waiting for something that is already there to manifest itself. Like Schwankmeier says, you know, you're not inventing anything. You're just creating the space for things to, to loosen up and, and ooze out you know there everything is already there so my relationship to the place was very much centered around this very patient um and curious exploration of um the pretty much the same circuits and so as 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 it often happens when you repeat a journey over and over, you sort of, the way I describe it is that I kept going around in circles, but I then quickly realized that the circles were spiral, was, were actually a spiral. And the, the further in, the further round I went, the further in I got and the further down. And um, the, the process was very long. The film took about seven years um, of journeying backwards and forwards. And then, as it often happens, most of the film actually was shot. All of, the, you know, I had hours and hours of footage, but most of the footage that makes the final film was shot on the last trip there, which I did with Mikey, and which was blessed with all of these encounters. But the encounters that you see in the films um, were, let's say the distillation of a very long process. You know, these are all people I had known, but then it was a moment of exactly ecstatic truth. It was a moment of connection that happened. It's like, I've, I've been in this space for six years, but it's the first time that I see that because the conditions were right to be able to see it in that particular moment. So the film is very much about, you know, very patiently, not even the process of peeling, back layers it's the process of being present while the world reveals itself to you and having the presence of mind and the and the instinct to be able to capture it that's very much i think at the heart of my work well thank you so much i mean i mean of course the patience that by necessity comes with animation uh, clearly has been also uh, at work as you said over the long the long period of time that um, you made this film in terms of the relationship building and the understanding of place i mean it's a great film of place as much as of the community who live within that place and because of course they broadly are, are resident there they're not people who you know we would imagine travel you know in 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 the way of a kind of globalized citizen they are absolutely yeah. committed to that landscape and that also of course is something very resonant for us now obviously but also you know speaks to a larger kind of way of being in the world i think that i, I think we're going to come back uh, back to later a little bit later in the session i'd like to just bring a a clip in now from the other film that we're uh, we're talking about a little bit later uh, today, Unquiet Earth, which is uh, set in uh, southern Spain, uh, again a, a southern part of the respective country, and again away from the kind of the the urban centres that uh, define uh, more obviously a political reality for each nation. But I wonder if you could just set up this clip because we'll thread the two films together. I think uh, very helpfully with this. So uh, just very quickly, first of all, I should say that this, the film we're about to see, The Unquiet Earth, is a collaboration. Is, I co-directed it with um, anthropologist Caterina Pasqualino, who's also from the south of Italy, different region, but lives mm. and has lived most of her life in, um, in um, um, France. And also her father was a um, very, very renowned puppet collector. So we, we met uh, on both fronts, really. Yeah, yeah. And uh, the film itself, um, um, again, follows a chance encounter with this orchard, which is introduced in the next clip. And it's, um, it's an um, 
orchard that was dug out of an illegal dumping ground by a group of unemployed men on the um, edge of the city of Granada. You know, the, the very pretty city we all know is very small and, and is quick to transform into the real Granada, which is a very different matter. Uh, where there's a lot of neglect and a lot of, like everywhere, a lot of um, marginalized existences that don't really have room to speak. So we stumbled into one of these um, of these um, realities and we decided that these were our people and um, the beautiful metaphor um, that they, you know, created for us, um, not just created, but they, that they created for themselves was that they saw this ravine that had been transformed into an illegal dumping ground. And at a particularly dramatic moment in their lives in, in the economic crisis of 2007, when they had lost all horizons, they decided that they would build their own horizon by digging and cleaning this ravine. And underneath it, they found a river and they bonified the earth and turned it into an orchard. Let's have a look at the first clip. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yeah. ¿Sabes la única tierra que tenemos nosotros aquí? La de la uña. <risa> Son las únicas tierras que tenemos. Y que tendrá siempre, no va a tener mucha más. Esto lleva un nudo especial para que no se estrangule la planta. Entonces, se le lía con mucho cuidado. Esto tiene que haber estado liado ya. Esto es un acto de resistencia, porque aquí lo ocupamos y aquí seguimos. Pero ¿sabes lo que ha pasado? Que como ha estado sin agua tres semanas, ya pues no podíamos tocar tampoco las plantas. Pensábamos que morían todos, ¿sabes? Más de dos semanas, ni una gota de agua, todo seco. Hemos pedido agua por todos los sitios, hemos acudido a una procesión del agua. Todo va bajando, bajando garrafas de agua. ¡Ya los tomates, que se hace de noche! Thank you so much. That was a clip from Unquiet Earth, if you'll remember. That's the second film. We're offering two films this week for you to have the chance to view free of charge globally, of course, care of LRB Screen at Home. My name's Gareth Evans and I'm hosting this week's conversation with the wonderful Chiara Ambrosio, who you will see on the screen next to me. We're talking about both Unquiet Earth and also uh, her other film, a wonderful documentary essay about uh, Southern Italian village, The Ghost Frequency. Don't forget, you can send questions, comments, as some of you already are doing. Wonderful to see those. We'll be coming to those very, very soon uh, via the YouTube comments uh, operation on the uh, YouTube page. Thank you for all your comments so far. Thank you very much for being with us. Just to remind you that this is uh, brought to you care of the LRB, of course, uh, the London Review of Books. And there is a very special, there we are, move that right there we are and there is a very special uh, subscription offer on during this screen at home initiative incredible deals uh, as you'd expect of course incredible scenes when these deals were announced uh, locally uh, around uh, near where <laughs> i live um we've got two ways of thinking about this i'm going to give you both of them and see which one you go with as, as sounding sonically more appealing we're offering 12 issues for £12. That is £1 an issue for six months. Now, whichever uh, time frame you'd like to operate on, if you feel confident uh, in the current lockdown period or going beyond the immediate, then of course, think about the uh, six monthly option. Otherwise, just think of a pound an issue and enjoy that for the for the dream offer it is. Uh, we're gonna post the, uh, the link to uh, get uh, direct access to that wonderful offer a little bit later on, um, but thank you very much for being with us. Now, we're gonna come, as I said, very shortly to the uh, online questions and many thanks for posting them, but it's great. Uh, to see that clip, uh, Kiara, alongside our watching of the ghost frequency, because clearly you're drawn to this this 
uh, enduring relationship that certain kinds of people have with a certain kind of place, a place that is either found, of course, in terms of the settlement they live in, or in this case with Unquiet Earth, actively made in the face of kind of marginalization and hostility. And, and the people who who kind of join join forces to make these places possible are are by any definition aren't they marginalized from the from the either the social or the economic mainstream of society it can differ in different places of course but you're clearly drawn to people who are trying to find new ways of living and being together often against the odds it seems yes and and as you were speaking something occurred to me which is that um I've also, you know, the, the films also mirror a journey in me and in my own sort of interests, of course, because I grow as a as a person, as a human being. And also I grow more and more of an emigrant. You know, I, I moved here over 20 years ago and my understanding of what uh, my relationship to place is, is also a, a very kind of mercurial and, and, and changeable um, factor too. So... I remember one thing um, when I went back to Italy. The first thing I was asking people at the very beginning of the of the shoot for for Ghost Frequency, when it was just a vague idea, I was um, starting conversations with people by asking them, "What is home to you?" Which was a very strange question to them because most of them had never left. Uh, so the idea of of having to think about what home means was quite a, a banal and redundant question because the only travel day experience was a forced emigration, you know, if you had to leave in order to go and work in Germany or America or Canada. And then, you know, the idea would be that you would come back or send money back. But there was never a question of, um, of, of not belonging to the place that had birthed you. So mm -hmm. one of the men I interviewed said this beautiful thing that isn't in the film, but he told me, um, Chiara, a man is made of um, a body and he is made of spirit. And the body moves around, but the spirit, the soul, is an elastic. And one end of it is is rooted in place. And you can pull, 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 but as soon as you let go, it springs back. And at the time when I made that film, I was like, yeah, yeah, it makes complete sense, you know. This com makes complete sense to me. And of course, time has gone by. And I am not sure I feel that way anymore um, about things. I have a very strong understanding of what connects you to the earth, but I don't necessarily think it's connected to um, the earth that birthed you. I think mm -hmm. it's more to do with a connection to the earth as a, as a right. So Santiago in the clip we just saw um, turns the earth. That's the first thing I shot in that film, turns the earth and he shakes his fingers at me. And, and we had just met, he said, see this? He's a gypsy, he lost his job. He's got nothing, you know, he lives on social services. He's one of the forgotten poets in, in, you know, he's a poet, he's a real poet, but he's a forgotten nothing for many people. That's how they see him. He shakes his fingers at me and says, see, the only thing, the only earth we'll ever own is the one that we have in these fingernails that work it. And, you know, <laughs> this idea that he doesn't own this earth but still he he cares for it because there is the belonging doesn't come from owning or being born in a place it comes from the care that you put into a place mm -hmm. and i think that this is a really interesting new way of thinking which also bleeds into the the work i'm doing now with london and my ongoing commitment with with the city of london you know i very much feel nowadays that um the, what you said about the collectivity you know, being together and committing together to a place is what um, creates um, belonging and what creates home. But, but all any like the home you you need. Absolutely. Thank you. That makes Thank you so much. Thank you, thank you so much. Let's keep talking about both films. Let's have a look at the second clip now. I think you probably uh, set it up for us and we can pick up on it immediately afterwards. Let's have a look at, uh, at the second clip now, the night scene, if we could. Thank you very much. Joder, los gallos como canta. <risa> Aire, fuego y agua.
las siete y media. Ya viene el día, ya Mira, viene el día. La mano es ella. Que llama ahí a mi primico José María. Oh, ese gallo está dando las siete y media. Aquí me refugio mucho. Y también me encuentro, a veces me encuentro solo, aunque estoy rodeado de mucha gente, ¿sabes? Ya va Antonio, va a ver el día. Mira, ya se está empezando a mover la amarilla, ya está saliendo el sol por el horizonte. Son colores azulados que vienen, pero ¿sabes lo que pasa? Que ese color gris azulado también está el blanco, aunque no lo veamos. Entonces, mientras sea gris, pues ahí estamos, entre tinieblas, entre la luz y la oscuridad. Thank you very much. That was a clip from Unquiet Earth, the uh, second film, of course, in our uh, amazing film offer for you this week. Both films made uh, by Chiara Ambrosio and Unquiet Earth, of course, a, a collaboration with Catalina as well. Uh, many thanks for being with us, Chiara. And now I'm really struck, of course, looking at that clip, that we're we're thinking in in in, in more expanded ways than perhaps we're used to. Uh, certainly from uh, governmental or, or uh, sort of institutional positions about what shelter means, how people make and construct a form of shelter, a kind of refuge against the storm, whether the storm be economic, social, uh, biomedical or otherwise. And uh, in this in this film, The Unquiet Earth, but also to a certain degree in Ghost Frequency as well, people have, have come together without any kind of external uh, prompt or, or certainly any kind of encouragement to make a space that it is viable for them to exist and ideally to thrive within. And I wonder what your thoughts were about both spaces once you've made the films uh, and obviously been on this journey with, with both communities and particularly uh, the journey of the orchard in the unquiet earth. Um, whether you felt that those spaces they, that were made uh, or, or uh, encouraged um, felt viable, felt secure, felt like they had a future. Uh, it's a it's a it's a very difficult question because the two spaces are very different. So the the um, Italian village um, is viable in the same way as it's always been viable for these people. The one thing that was really interesting is that I took the film back there. We had a screening in the actual village, and everyone came. There were over two hundred of the present villagers, you know, old people, whatever, who were who were absolutely involved in a conversation about um, whether the film was critiquing, um, um, whether it was sort of, um, well, rather than critiquing, whether it was um, wrongly celebrating abandon, mm -hmm. the, the abandonment mm -hmm. of the place, um, and using that as a way to um, portray a <laughs> lack of life, or whether instead the film was celebrating life, you know, and actually proposing a, a new way of looking at these kind of villages where they are not dying, but rather they are, you know, they are rebirthing in a different way. And so it was an interesting space to create, you know, the film, the film became an interesting space in which to discuss these things and and i was very pleasantly surprised by how actively involved all the people there were in this kind of conversation you know very very um important space for them to have a platform to to actually voice these concerns the spanish film is very different because the, you know the, the orchard is literally run by a group of unemployed men and most of them live extremely precarious lives mm -hmm. and so at the time when at the time when we shot the film they were all extremely dedicated to the space and to the to the you know it was a, it was a happy time the 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 orchard was flourishing and they were all committed to it and then you know life gets in the way and so some of them get pulled in one direction pulled in another direction so when we went back the last time the the orchard was was in a state of transformation you know not as much care had been put into it so it's it's a place that very much moves according to the the way the the shape of their lives moves so the question there is also that they don't get any help whatsoever yeah. from from the government or anything. So it really relies on their extremely precarious lives. But this said, it was extremely incredible to see how committed 
no matter what the hardships are, how committed some of them. I mean, in, in on occasion, there were only like four people, you know, planting, you know, digging out entire cliffs to plant trees, fruit trees, you know, three of them with shovels, which is how they clean the thing. And one last thing I would like to say in terms of the um, legacy of the film is that the first shot of the of On Quiet Earth, when they're digging a hole, was the last thing we shot long after the film was finished we mm. we felt we were missing something mm. and we came up with this idea to go back and shoot this scene and it was winter <coughs> and um they were at a low in their lives and uh, they were really you know struggling to to be there with us but we managed to get them together we only had half a day a storm was brewing and um i said look um i need you to dig a hole and they were looking at me what do you mean dig a hole you know, we're busy, you know, I'm a caretaker being paid 80 cents an hour. I'm tired, you know, I haven't slept in two months. And eventually he was like, you know, okay, I'm committed to this film, let's do it. And he was like, but we've got only, you know, an hour. So tell me where I need to dig. And I was literally, you know, I was, I didn't have any time. I didn't, I hadn't planned the shot, you know. I said, okay, I just pointed. I said, there, just dig there. And he was like, just there. I'm like, yeah, just start digging and let's shoot it because otherwise we'll never do it. So he started digging and he kept digging. And in the middle of the shot, you know, his um, abusive owner, like um, the um, employer called him to say he had withheld his um, pay for the last two months. So he was in the middle of this hole with a shovel, speaking on his mobile phone, screaming, you know, saying, I've got my rights, you know, you have to pay me. So it was a very dramatic moment. He turned the phone off. Uh, and he said, what, is it enough? I said, no, please keep digging. And he was like, how far do I have to go? I'm like, just dig, please dig. And he kept digging and digging. And I was like, I was shooting and I was like, how am I gonna get out of this? What are we looking for? And at a certain point he stops and he looks up and goes, water, water. And so we run and sure enough, he had hit on a new vein of water in that exact spot. So I've got a photograph of this like <laughs> eye of water underneath. And it was an extraordinary celebration because, of course, they have extreme problems with droughts there. Mm -hmm. So this was an incredible resource they had just discovered. And they only discovered it because we randomly decided to commit this one last moment together to the film. So I believe in the power of making films together. You know, films are wonderful. We all experience them. But the most important thing is to make them. The process of making a film creates that shelter it creates a it, it gives agency to people it gives them visibility it gives them an understanding of how powerful they are in transforming the world so you know the making of a film is not just planning a strategy on how to distribute it which i'm not very good at but you know but it's the making of it that is you know the most important thing in my opinion Tremendous, that's a fantastic anecdote and a great result, of course. Always dig further, everyone out there, I think. I mean, <laughs> always have a spade with you wherever you might travel. Right? But always, when you think you're going to give up, just dig that a little bit further. Um, I'm not drinking water this evening. I've, I've got a gin and tonic on the go. Uh, I believe Kiara has whiskey. We do hope that wherever yeah. you are, whatever you're drinking, yes. you're enjoying it. That's great. Uh, we're going to move now to some uh, rather special questions that are coming in. Uh, thick and fast now we've got a a, a real wonderful response to uh, as uh, to this week's uh, program as of course i would expect um we're going to go straight in i think to uh one of our regular viewers listeners uh, attendees many thanks aurora coming from the the far pacific northwest aurora is back and we're delighted that you are and this is a question bringing in some wonderful fellow travelers we're all pleased to have uh, known and to have worked with and michaels and john berger in the publication rail tracks which you can find exclusively available from the london review bookshop if you look online rail tracks london review bookshop and in that Anne a says to john a photograph of a ghost is is sound and john answers your face in the window now that seems to me to be turned into a kind of question. Can you speak to the choices you've made to use still images, long exposure, uh, spider's web or a shadow, uh, key moments of movement against this longer form of duration? How did you find the pace of the film? I, the, the place I imagine gave a lot to you, but when did you settle into the rhythm of the, of the, of the, of the work? Thank you, it's great work, great uh, question. Um, there are no actually, there are no still, images in the film it's all moving so that's that's an important thing and um i think the rhythm of it as i said earlier came from my circular walks repeated circular walks in the place you know these um 
I mean, I should say that I know those rhythms intimately because I've I, I know that from when I was little, you know, I grew up um, and spent a lot of time in those particular <coughs> rhythms of nature. So um, the way the light moves and the way the sounds move around you, um, the way things move around you at different times of the day are things I remember very uh, bodily. I, I sort of remember in my body. So um, a lot of it came from me being in place. So I shot, uh, I would say, 98% of the film. The only, the, there's the first trip I did, I went with a friend who's a wonderful director of photography, Michal Rulka, and um, he shot the opening sequence um, of the procession and um, a, a little bit of an internal uh, shot of, of a house. The rest I shot, and so a lot of those rhythms came from my body in place and finding a way, in a way, to learn how to be present myself. So I would leave the camera and just wait. What I chose to frame is, is interesting. You know, that's really the question. The question is how do you frame in, in those contexts? Because everything is, is everywhere at all, the, at all moments in time. So a lot of that was dictated by sound. Mm -hmm. So, um, I, you know, I'm, I'm reminded of someone like, I don't know, Janet Cardiff, the artist, who really uses sound to direct your, your way of looking. And sound is something that is really pivotal to my experience as a filmmaker. So sound directs me and, and often shows me what I need to see. So uh, a creak in a door or, or a wind rattling something would make me look up and I would, would see something. Um, and the juxtaposition between um, you know, the, the length of things was very much something that came um, later in edit. And again, through a relationship with um, my wonderful uh, composer partner, Bird Radio, who, um, you know, music is a, music and sound is a, a fundamental part of my editing choices. So the way the film comes together um, is very much um, a holistic sort of, process you know it's about trying to translate the experience of being in time but without uh, having the luxury of having four hours to do it so for example the opening sequence the dawn sequence um lasted a lot longer than seven minutes <laughs> let me tell you it was about five hours but um we found ways of um the first step was to edit the sound so we we we, we sort of shrunk five hours into seven minutes. And then I managed to find ways, there are no tricks to the film, there's no post-production. So mm -hmm. it's just literally very, very careful fades and editing through different times of the day. Tremendous, thank you so much. We're getting um, questions about sound and I think you probably uh, probably answered those now. I'd like to um, uh, thank everyone who's coming in with all sorts of uh, fascinating comments and responses. We'll try and cover everything, of course, um, as we always hope to do. Um, I'd like to ask you now about the animals, if I could. Uh, Adam Huffman, many thanks, Adam, for coming in from Oxford. I hope we've answered your earlier question about sound, but you, you do raise this issue of animals. Something crucial about the animals, you say, the cockerel and the dog, both places incomplete without them. Could you sort of speak out loud for us a little bit about other species, the natural world as a kind of equal partner in the, in the narrative, perhaps? Absolutely. I mean, um, I think we're all familiar with uh, Sir David Attenborough, and when I look at his work on the an on the um, on the plants, for example, when he m shows you the incredible exuberant movement of plants, you know, I saw it for the first time in his programs, and it completely blew my mind to see how much force um, plants have in terms of movement as well. I am absolutely aware that plants are alive and, and nature is alive but to actually see it move is quite an interesting thing because we do, rarely see it move i guess what's interesting about a place like verbicado is one of the few places where you can actually see nature move you don't see it while it is moving but you you see the aftermath of the movement you know and so what's really amazing to me is that every year i i went back and I found things have had completely transformed, and mostly due to um, 
um, nature reclaiming things, but not just nature, uh, microorganisms, um, moss growing all over the place, roots and the earth mm. sort of falling over things, water, air, wind, everything. And animals, animals everywhere. The animals are the great um, guardians and custodians of that place. They set the pace. I should say that to Aurora from the Pacific Northwest uh, as well, that the animals are very much um, a pivotal um, uh, a crucial way of understanding the rhythm of those places because when the animals sleep, everything sleeps. Mm -hmm. And when the animals wake, everyone, very much like your cat actually, Gareth, it was so apt to your introduction because really it's, it's about shifting the attention um, onto um, a different way of looking where we are no, not really central anymore, but to call that uh, dead or abandoned is rather absurd because the place my intention was to actually show how alive the place was and to try and be as un, like unobtrusive as possible while doing that you know i was obviously present and i did not want to hide my presence but i was communing with something that wasn't necessarily um me or my kind of gaze it was sort of my gaze encountering a different perspective Tremendous. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm aware of, of time passing, as it always does, of course. Uh, uh, hard to avoid that. And I'd like to bring in uh, the first of the clips we have from your ongoing project, because there's no question that uh, it feeds directly into discussion of both the films that we've been enjoying over the last week. So I wonder if we could have a look at the first clip. Let's just show it, I think, and then I'll, I'll uh, pick up on it with you afterwards, Kiara, if we could. Just yeah. for, for viewers out there, this is quite dark, so don't adjust your sets, as they used to say. Um, it's a, it's a scene at night, and I think uh, you will enjoy it, and I hope you will enjoy it, and uh, you stay with us, and, and we'll see you afterwards. Thank you very much. fades into view, my home, my vessel, airborne and unmoored, the city, my body, my story, a place in the time to settle over all other places and times like dust on a table, no more than a moat, but I move through these streets like electricity for a while and they are crowded with the living and the dead, and their stories, buried in the ground, will turn to brick and rise once more. A bird, a flight, a wilderness before the flood. Backs turn as I walk by. The city, our stories, our darkness, a gathering of elements on the horizon. Fire and ice rewriting the boundaries of our loneliness while we stand in doorways waiting for the storm to blow over. Thank you so much. That is a clip, uh, a scene, a, a, a cut from the uh, forthcoming feature length project that Kiara is working on called Raft, which takes a lot of these themes forward, but gives it a particular lens of contemporary London. Now, we're going to be definitely be talking about that very shortly, but I'm aware of other questions that are, are still uh, in the air from uh, the previous films that we've been enjoying this week. I really want to pick up on those. Many thanks uh, to questions from Paul, from Patrick, from Helena, from Matt. I hope we've um, answered those questions in the responses we've had so far. I think we've uh, we've covered those points. I do hope you feel that. I'd like to just bring these questions together now, if I could, Kiara, uh, thinking about uh, ghost frequency. A uh, question from one of our regular viewers, Jill. Many thanks, Jill. Uh, thinking about the passing of time and so on, but also particularly relating uh, the mood of the film to Natalia Ginsburg's writing, and in particular, uh, the book Voices in the Evening, where past and present merge into a kind of suspension of, of temporality. Now, I'd like to just think a little bit, if we can, if, uh, if she is an important writer to you, Chiara, about Natalia, but just hold that, uh, hold that thought, if you could, for a minute, because there are two questions. One to do uh, with uh, the beginning of the film, uh, the, the symbolically flagellating children in white hoods at the beginning 
of the ghost frequency. We're left wanting to know more about them. And Richard, that's from Carol, many thanks, Carol. And Richard um, asks about the, uh, the finality, of, if you like, asks if you hadn't gone back a final time and had to use footage from earlier trips, how different would the film have been? Now, I think he might be talking about the unquiet earth there, but, um, but it, perhaps that applies also to aspects of ghost frequency. So we're, we're thinking about Natalia Ginsberg, an important writer, of course. Uh, we're thinking about the white hooded children and we're thinking about what if you hadn't been able to go back? What would you have done? Does that make sense? Yes, and first of all, I uh, have to admit I'm a I'm an avid reader, but I have never read anything by um, Natalia Ginsburg. So that's uh, uh, I won't be able to answer that. However, I can say that um, in terms of the temporality and the way things move, you know, I think I remember. I don't know if it was Jill from last week, but there was a question about um, Tarkovsky. Um, in relationship to Ben Rivers' film. And I think the writings of Tarkovsky um, are something that has, I mean, and his films, of course, has um, had a massive impact on my way of thinking about how to structure a film. And in particular, I'm thinking about points of threshold. So um, I think of the um, dawn sequence, for example, at the beginning of um, Ghost Frequency as a, um, as a place in which we have to stop, almost like a, a waiting room, a salle de pas perdu, some, somewhere where we are shedding our, our rhythms and our, our, our patterns. Um, and almost like cleaning ourselves before going into a sauna, you know, we have to wash ourselves and then enter a new space of perception. So the function of um, the threshold within film is something I'm really interested in. And perhaps uh, Tarkovsky was the first time I, um, in, you know, I experienced that in, you know, every time I watch one of his films, I have a moment in which I, I mean, some people call it falling asleep. For me, it's a moment of like entering a deeper state of being, you know, I nod off. And when I nod back, I am awake, but I'm beyond awake. You know, I am, all my senses are tuned. So that's that's one way I think about it, temporality. Another way of answering the question. The hooded figures, um, that's in a way the most picturesque, um, as picturesque as the film gets. You know, that's a very typical sh display in the south of Italy. And the reason why I presented it as, um, as something vanishing and never returning is, first of all, because that's exactly how I experienced it. You know, usually the only thing you know about these places abroad are these sort of picturesque displays of um, rituals, religion, which are a really important part of, of the culture. But what you fail to understand is that these things are, are sort of remnants of, of another existence. And often that's exactly how they appear. They appear for the duration of the ritual and then everybody goes back, disappears out of the village and never comes back until the next year for the next ritual. And so I thought it would be a really interesting way to present the space as a place that had been at once occupied and then sort of evacuated um, and leave the sense of mystery as to um, what does it mean to, to occupy a place and what does it mean to attempt to return and the last question about returning i do think i i did mention so i think he did he was talking about this film i mentioned that most of the footage was um ended up being what i shot on the last mm. trip there and i think that it was um it might have been a very different film because <coughs> although the shot the you know my way of looking is 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 similar right you know i am i am um, attracted by certain things, but the film itself, very much like the, the Unquiet Earth, was a process. And so I have no doubt that um, um, the place I was led to is where I had to get to in order to tell this story. Um, it's very difficult to consider what I, it might have been. Most of the encounters that you see in the film <laughs> happened on the last trip. So it would have been an extremely different film. Um, uh, something I'd never like to discover because I would never re-edit it ever again. <laughs> <laughs>
No, it was a long process, wasn't it? And um, you know, we're very glad that you took that time. Um, I'm I'm struck by uh, your conversational points around thresholds and the idea of kind of nodding back into a heightened state of senses being fully tuned. I would say, of course, to everyone watching that we have uh, incredible ways now of monitoring your own uh, alertness uh, during the course of the viewing process. Um, Anthony and Sam are directly involved in that the parallel structure, of course, alongside the delivery of the programme. And so we do hope you're staying alert, of course, absolutely. No longer staying at home in, in terms of the British lockdown ad, uh, advice, uh, but staying alert wherever you are uh, for danger and threat all around you. And of course, also for ecstasy. The ecstatic truth is all around us, if only we know how to look. Um, many thanks indeed, Kiara, for uh, responding to those. We're going to look now, if we could, uh, at the second clip from Raft. If we could see this now, please. Thank you very much. Thank you very, very much indeed. So that was a second clip from the ongoing uh, Creative Feature Link project, uh, Raft. Kiara, could you just give us a sense of that, please, and where that might sort of sit in the overall film? Yes, so that was um, um, a scene with Navros Oramaria, a wonderful uh, Kurdish um, political refugee, friend, singer, um, and presence in, in London, in, in my London landscape, which Raft is very much um, a film about. And um, I chose this clip because it, it gives an idea of how the film tries to negotiate the relationship between um, the reality of the city and the way in which the city is transformed by what we plant into it. So very much similar to the to the unquiet earth. Um, Navros is a, is a wonderful singer and, and his, his existence within the city is very much um, um, shaped by his the, the, the sound that he releases within it. So um, I'm I'm looking for ways within the film to sort of weave this story, this sort of choral a portrait of a place that is um, that is multiple places, but really what it is is um, a raft, a platform on which we all stand together and transform it and imbue it with um, the life um, and um, and potential and um, and um, growth that it needs in order to thrive. Um, and the film, is, again, it's very much about the process of making the film, of bringing people together on the raft, but also an understanding that physical presence is something fundamental for our communal survival, um, as are um, venues, independent venues. Um, I should say sort of that most of the people I work with in the film, apart from friends, you know, apart from being friends, they're also um, um, what might be uh, called by some people um, um, marginal, again, marginal existences um, at different degrees uh, of the spectrum, but people who um, are very central to my um, mm -hmm. city. So I would like to uh, use this film to highlight how the question itself is perhaps redundant because this, this tension between the marginal and the... Uh, 
and the perhaps a void, null and void, when you start looking at uh, the resonances that each person has within their own lives um, and how they intersect and connect. Tremendous. Thank you very much. Well, of course, Raft is a project very much uh, focused on the people and the places of London, as you as you said. But of course, it speaks to a to an international scenario of, of precarity, whether around uh, the cost of living in in urban centres, access to property, of course, and now you know the extra vulnerabilities that that will inevitably ensue following uh, the virus in its current incarnation. And one place we you know we both worked in, and and obviously uh, also worked um, in terms of a collaboration with the LRB, has been it's been the Horse Hospital in Bloomsbury in central London, which is a a wonderful venue that's been. Uh, vulnerable for a long time, well beyond and before uh, uh, the, the current situation we find ourselves in. But just if you could just give us a little sense of of, uh, of, of the horse hospital and why it matters to you, just very briefly. Well, the horse hospital uh, is a place that's been there for over 23 years. It's um, a supreme example of the power of, um, of that one person has in um fighting the good fight. Um, there is a, a large network around the horse hospital and um, in no way Roger Roger Burton, the keeper of the horse hospital, he's, he's doing this with the help and support of many people, but the reality is that he is um, putting himself, so to speak, in front of the flood. <coughs> And he is stopping it with his hands, very much like the saints in the south, south, south of Italy, Naples, that, you know, have a hand up to the volcano and stop, you know, allegedly are able to stop the eruption. You know, that's a very important thing to be reminded of, the fact that when we all despair and think that, you know, God knows what it takes in order for things to change. Well, what it takes is commitment, um, is the commitment of one person, of another person over there. And part of the... Um, Part of the raft idea is to make people aware of each other's commitment because often we all suffer from from being isolated we like we think we're isolated now but in normal life we are uh, at the best of times unaware of 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 the many ways in which we overlap and intersect and i think it's very powerful to know that someone down the road from you is is doing something that that ripples so far and the 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 consequences the ben, you know the the positive consequences of which will have an impact on your life and so the horse hospital is one of those places it's a it's a shelter it's a hospital it's where we go to be cured it's it's the the place where that keeps our 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 minds free it's a um, platform for all it's one of the truly democratic venues in london and it needs help so everybody can go on the website and um help them out at the moment but also um use it as a model because roger is doing this not just to keep a venue going he's doing it to remind us all of how important it is to believe that you can change things for the best for the better you know tremendous thank you it's a huge uh, vote of advocacy for the horse hospital but of course for similar venues around the world we all, we all will know of spaces that are under threat that are precarious that are defended by one or more people in ways that are miraculous and obviously uh, necessary in the in the deepest way so uh, whether it's the horse hospital in london if you're uh, living locally uh, or your version of that venue elsewhere please do support all these venues of course um particularly at this time but obviously ongoing into the future um, who knows where we might find ourselves Many thanks indeed for that um, passionate call to arms for the for the horse hospital, uh, Kiara. We've got one more question now, which in a way relates to what you've been saying, because you are a filmmaker, you're an animator, uh, you're a radio broadcaster, you're a musician, you're a flamenco dancer, you're many, many things. And uh, you're also a publisher and you publish uh, this wonderful uh, zine project, As Far As The Eye Can Travel. And Catherine Barouche, many thanks, Catherine, for your question, has been wondering about, if you like, the relationship between these different elements of your work, because, of course, the, the, the zine is, uh, as the title would suggest, as far as the eye can travel, about place and space and distance and creativity, um, where, where we can and obviously at the moment can't necessarily travel uh, as we would like to on the ground. And so I just wonder if you could just kind of close this, this session for us just by thinking briefly about how you see different works finding their platform, finding their expression, whether it might be a film, an animation, a publication and so on. Um, it's obviously part of a lifelong project for you in which life and art are very clearly uh, working together. But uh, what, what prompts an expression and, and how does it find its, its kind of uh, form? 
Well, I should say, if we start, thank you, Kate. Hi, Kate. Um, if we start from the, the zines, the zines, um, I, you know, I've been taking photographs for as long as I can remember. And um, the, the zine project started six years ago because I, I come from a analog photography, but I very much work in digital now. And I was lacking the, the materiality of, 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 of the book, you know, and I should also mention that I work for the wonderful book art bookshop, Tanya Peixoto's beautiful independent artist book bookshop in London that has also had a massive inspiration in my own sensibility as a, as a human. So the, the book has a magical um, ability to hold things together, you know, and also it's, a, it's an incredible a tool of resistance. It's, it, the book resists its paper. It can be slipped into people's hands. It, it survives. It travels. It can be spread out. I'm very interested in independent, you know, press and underground press and, and all of that. And um, the project itself is about um, re re returning, in a way, to the dimension of the of the talismanic and and um, and alchemical. So you know the idea of distilling an experience of a place or a, or an encounter um, in a in a small book. All my zines fit inside the palm of the hand um, at various degrees, and um, the idea behind it is that you transform and mark and celebrate an encounter or a place through the making of the book, and the book becomes then something that you take away almost as a form of pil pilgrimage and. Um, Kate, who asked the question, um, is an expert in pilgrimage, and that's I, I, I'm sure she she knows that side of things. Um, I should say that this return to the small is is also a very important part uh, of all of my work, and it links all of my outputs together. I think if I can finish with one with one sentiment, is that I am very interested in creating a space for what we can't see to become visible again because often our lives are so much richer than what we are able to see and the poetry of of the marginal the poetry of the small everything that 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 sort of illuminates our our existences and is often overlooked that is what interests me and um it's not small it's not marginal it's very much central and i think that if we become if we awake to that idea that things are released into the ether and and surround us. Um, we are surrounded by vision. We are surrounded by dream, and we are surrounded similarly by the um, by the ability to transform what we see into something better. Changing the narratives, you know, small narratives exist and survive. It's just a question of uh, dismantling these these platforms that that make them invisible and and feed us this single um may you know overbearing narrative that is supposed to erase everything else um i don't believe in that i believe that it is our duty as as seers to make things visible again because some people's lives depend on that well that's a tremendous uh, uh summation of a roundup a call uh uh, an act of advocacy. Thank you so much indeed, Kiara, for that. Please do find all of Kiara's projects on her website at curiousroom.com. Uh, we're delighted that Ghost Frequency is available to view uh, throughout the current period, free to view, and you'll find that again on Kiara's uh, Vimeo uh, channel website, but you can find it all through the, all through her own personal website at Curious Room. Um, she's making uh, The Unquiet Earth uh, available to us until the end of the week. The link uh, and passwords are provided for you in the uh, newsletter, which you by, by definition, I hope will have seen to be with us uh, this evening. Uh, we're going to look now, uh, before I, I formally close and hand over to our wonderful uh, musician, composer, sound artist, Bird Radio, to, to play us out. We're going to look now um, at the trailer uh, for next week's film, if we could, which is called A Transfigured Night. It's a conversation with the wonderful embodied philosopher Alfonso Lingus at his home uh, near Baltimore, uh, made by uh, the art theorist and curator Adrian Heathfield and the photographer Hugo Glendinning, who both of whom will be with me uh, next week, next Wednesday at 7 p.m. UK time, BST, uh, for the uh, conversation following uh, their week-long uh, viewing of uh, Transfigured Night, the trailer of which we're about to see, which of course is free to view, as always, globally, uh, wherever you might find yourself. So let's please have a look at the trailer now before I thank Kiara formally.
it's strange the power mm. this invisible power of the other's gaze you know you don't see the other's gaze you, know? you don't see what the other sees uh, of the environment and of oneself there was something about Lingus's written voice so elegantly bare so attentive to others and to being in relation somehow there's this power mm. in the eyes turned to look at one that um, I guess I feel now as strongly as ever. I, I when I look at someone else, um, one's eyes makes contact with these, you know, eddies of pleasure and pain on the other's face, mm. or the anguish in the eyes. There's really a. Uh, it's not like you know, observation, like viewing something, seeing something at a distance. It's more than that. There's a real touch. Mm. Um, and conversely, an image, a visual image, can touch one. The, the surface of the face is this very unusual place where um, forms, ridges, lines form and deform and vanish. Mm. Um, so it's a, uh, it's a substance that's in some way very insubstantial, you know, very, you know, uh, its form is very ephemeral and changeable. Thank you so much. That was the trailer for Transfigured Night, a conversation with Alfonso Lingus, which will be our film of the week, uh, available from tomorrow until next week, uh, when I will be in conversation with Adrian Hugo, who made the film. I do hope you can join us for that. Thank you very much indeed for being with us uh, today. As always, uh, without you, we are nothing. Quite literally, we are floating unattached in the ether, um, uh, unable to find our way home, which, of course, is where we are currently. Thank you very much indeed. Uh, many thanks, of course, to Sam, to Anthony, to Claire, Natalia, everyone at the London Review Bookshop and the London Review of Books for making this possible. Let me just remind you of this extraordinary uh, subscription offer you have, 12 issues for £12 or £1 an issue for six months. Please do go to lrb.me slash screen. That's lrb.me, M-E, forward slash screen, and you will find the extraordinary subscription offer there. Uh, the current issue of the LRB uh, features a uh, Ian Sinclair, of course, a previous contributor to this very strand, uh, where he's talking about Belgium, and he's talking about a lot more than just Mool Free, although we do love the Mool with uh, a nice, cool craft ale of the Belgian variety. Wherever you might find yourself, I do hope you enjoy the rest of the evening, but your enjoyment will be set in motion by the extraordinary uh, presentation we're about now to have. From Bird Radio, a.k.a. Mikey Kirkpatrick, the composer of the haunting score for Ghost Frequency and much else but besides, please do... Look online for Bird Radio and you will find all sorts of incredible sonic delights, uh, including, not least, uh, uh, Bird Radio's release of uh, an album tracking and performing alongside and incarnating poems from Ted Hughes's Crow, uh, which is 50 years old this year, uh, a radical new uh, take on Ted Hughes's poems Crow, uh, just one of the many albums that Bird Radio has released. Uh, welcome, Mikey. Many thanks indeed for being with us. It's a real pleasure to have you play us out this evening. And I will now hand uh, hand hand things over to you. Uh, thanks, everyone, for being with us. Do stay with us for the forthcoming weeks. Uh, but now do please welcome Mikey Kirkpatrick, a.k.a. Bird Radio. Thank you so much, Gareth and Chiara. Um, I thought that what I would do to close today is um, to think around place. And I want to go back to the village to Verbicaro, where La Frequenza Fantasma was filmed. Um, and I want to just bring in a couple of ideas. One concept, which is the makam, which is um, in Middle Eastern music, the alternative name for a scale, which means place. Um, it has a home, an origin, and the melody is a journey from the home away to various resting points and a return home. And I'm going to improvise around a melody, um, a piece of music, which is Eternella which is a return. Um, and in the lyrics of that piece is a um, conversation with a bird asking um, a migrating bird to send home letters of love. Um, so I wanted to close with that um, and it will be um, fully improvised. Thank you so much for inviting me to close this wonderful Thank conversation. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mikey. Thank mm -hmm. you.
Thank you so much. 